for Jesus. That's all you got? Come on, give Jesus five seconds of your best for Jesus right now. Throw it up there. It took me three times to get that signal to you, Jordan. All right, turn to somebody, give him a fist bump, say good morning, my brother and my sister, and then have a seat. We are uh, excited to have you with us. I just want to take a moment to look in the camera and welcome all of you watching online, wherever you are watching from. We love you. Uh, we're, you're a part of our church. Uh, thanks for dialing in and, and catching what we're uh, laying down today. So thanks for being here. And as always, I want to say hi to those of you here in-house, first and foremost, the beloveds in my heart. Good morning, Balcony. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. It's pretty good. You over on the stage right side. It looked like you were phoning it in. I'm just saying. Um, okay. Hello, hello, Nave. Yeah, transept on my right. That's one family. Uh, one family of four right there, and they're little biddies actually. There's two of them. Hello, transept left. She's a mighty force to be dealt with. Um, hey, we are so excited to have you with us on this Sunday morning. And if you've never been here, we always open that way because it's fun to celebrate Jesus. Um, and, and you got if you're not celebrating Jesus and cheering as loud as you would for your favorite team, who sometimes is going to let you down, you're not getting it right. That's right. There you go. That's it. That's all you get from me, okay? Everybody just be quiet about it. Um, so we're excited to have you with us on this Sunday morning. Um, today is day eight of 21 days of prayer and fasting. We began last week, uh, last Sunday, and then immediately Monday, uh, we, we got in here at six o'clock in the morning. So if you weren't here last week, we're, we're doing, we do this every January, 21 days of prayer and fasting. And um, Monday through Friday, we're in this room at 6 a.m. Come on, somebody, that's early. Um, like this, the sun hasn't decided to wake up at that point. Um, you know, at 6 a.m., we're here and. Last Monday, we had 66 people in here. Yeah, you can cheer for that. That was awesome. Now, the enthusiasm didn't last the entire week, to be honest. Uh, but we have been averaging over 50 every day, Monday through Friday this week. Saturdays at 9 o'clock. So those of you who can't get up at 6 and be somewhere, uh, you can come Saturdays at 9. We would love to have you there with us. It's just been a great, great experience. We printed these uh, prayer books this year. Um, it says our next 70, if I can get to my cover, our next 70. There's a whole bunch of them still in the, in the back, I believe, and a, a lot of other prayer resources. Uh, we have our prayer sheet for the leaders of our country, of our state, of our community uh, and church to pray for. We have those prayer books to help you. If, you don't, if you're like, man, Pastor Michael, I don't know how to pray, we got some books to help you and walk through those things. We have these blue bracelets that say pray first. Man, I encourage all of you to take one of these and, and wear it. Because a pray first mentality is something that we all need in every aspect of our life. Hey, before you send that email, pray first. Before you post that comment on social media, pray first and then pray second. And then let's just not even do it, right? Um, there's so many things, like just pray first. What, what would it be like if we entered into everything that we did with prayer? Um, and, and so we, we do that. I, I would love to see you tomorrow morning, 6 o'clock, we'll be here as well. And um, in these prayer books, today our focus is prayer for church ministries. And um, grab one of these. We're, we're all praying the same prayer every day. Um, and, and then in the back also, in, in your pew seats, there should be some connection cards in there behind, hiding behind hymnals or, or Bibles or something. Um, but there are some prayer cards on the back table as well. And, and up here, what you can't see is there is a whole lot of uh, these prayer cards um, that have been submitted by people who, who want prayer. Because what happens in here on those six o'clock mornings is those 50 plus people, they're coming up and, and they're grabbing these prayer cards. They'll take one or two of them and then they'll go back to their seat and they're praying for you. Like they're spending some intense time. Like we got some prayer warriors that show up in here who are coming. And then they'll come and they'll put those back and they'll grab some more and somebody's taking those. And, and so if you have something going on in your life, like if, you, if you got a, you're struggling, you have an issue going on, you, you're making a decision in your life, whatever it is, you need, you need prayer. Let us pray for you. Um, let us join you in that prayer. And so I, I encourage you to fill one of those prayer cards out, the connection card, whatever. When the offertory buckets come by, you can drop it in there, and, then, and they will be up here, and you will be covered um, in prayer for the next uh, 13 days uh, of, of our 21 days. So that was quick math in my head right there. Um, so we are excited about that, and we'd love to see you tomorrow morning. Um, today is uh, the second part of our series that we started last week. 
And we entitled it Above and Beyond is what we're talking about, Above and Beyond. And it comes from, if you were here last week, we're, we're talking about um, specifically Paul's letter to the Ephesians. But as we talked about last week, it really wasn't just to them. It was to all the churches in, in that area, in the A Asia province. And it was all of those kind of Greek churches that he had a hand either in directly starting, uh, planting, or one of the people that he trained helped plant it. And so he's writing this church, not just this letter, not just to them, really, because it's really to us as well. Because we're the Gentile church, right? I mean, not many of us, some of us have Jewish blood in us, but not all of us do. And so we're the outsiders and we're the Gentiles. And, and he's writing it to us. It wasn't ever meant just to be a personal letter to the specific place and time. It was meant to really go throughout the ages. The first part of it, as we talked about, is kind of this beautiful poetic um, poem and prayer of, of foundational elements reminding us of who we are. It, it's, it's reaching in and saying, hey, this is who Jesus is, and this is who you are because of him. And, and he comes up with this beautiful prayer that transitions into the, the next part of, of this book. And the next part is about, okay, so what does it look like? What are the ethical standards, the implications, the practical side of how this is all supposed to go down? But it's that transition prayer that, we, that we've been focusing on last week, and we're going to continue to walk through it verse by verse for the next few weeks. It's a prayer found in chapter 3. Of Ephesians, And it says this, when I think of all of this, and, and again, what he's thinking of is, is who Christ is and who we are because of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. When I think of all this, I fall on my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. That Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or imagine. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. See, that's the part that includes us, for all generations, forever and ever. Like this prayer wasn't just for them in a specific place and time, it's for us. We're the all generations. We're those people who he's, who he's speaking to. And, and remember last week, if you were here, we talked about that he begins with the Father. Like he begins this prayer and he's like, and, and he starts at the very beginning, the Father. It's the most important thing for Paul is for us to understand that we are in relationship with the Father. At St. Andrews, what we say is, we want you to know God. That's our primary focus. We're, like, we want you, if you don't get anything out of, out of you coming here, we want you to get into a relationship with Jesus, to know God as Father. And so Paul is saying, like, this is the foundation. This is the, the firm foundation, the rock upon which I stand, is that you know who Jesus is. Then he takes it a little bit deeper because it, it's, a, it's great and it's wonderful and we want you to give your life to Jesus and to know God, but if you just stop there, you're missing so much of what God has for you. You're, you're missing so much of the fullness of life that Jesus talks about. And so he doesn't leave us there. He takes us, takes us deeper. And he goes into this next section, this section where he says, I pray that the, the glorious unlimited resources of God, that he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit, then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down deep into God's love and keep you strong. See, this next section he's gonna focus on, okay, here's, here's where you were when you, when you met Jesus and came into this relationship. But man, there's more. You can't just stay there. Because the, the fact of the matter is, the time in which Paul was writing, the winds of the world were strong. Like he was writing to a group of people in an age and a time when, when being a follower of Jesus was looked down upon and even, even threatened, your life was threatened because of it. They were worshiping in a world that stood against them. Hey, let me tell you, the times that Paul was writing aren't so different from the times in which we find ourselves. The world in which we live is still against those who claim Jesus and follow the ways of Jesus. And so this truth, this thing that he's talking about is, is, is just as relevant and important to us today as it was to them. He says, I want you to focus on your inner strength, to, to get Christ in 
to your heart and to get those roots deep down. Man, those, those deep roots, you know, Miss Natalie just did it with her, her little drawings and, and clip art stuff. That wasn't clip art, like she cut it out. She did it herself. Just, you know, she talked about the deep roots. And, you know, uh, it's, it was interesting. The first service, the 915, I was talking to some older folks, and they were um, talking about frozen bushes that they had at their house and the freeze and landscaping and gardening and things because apparently that's what older folks talk about. Um, and I came in and on the conversation, and they're like, well, how are your bushes? I'm like, I don't know. That's Jenna's job. She takes care of that stuff. I don't, I don't go outdoors and do stuff. That's ridiculous. Um, and, but, but it brought to mind a story, and, I, and, I, and, it, and so I, I told it to them at the 915. I'm sorry. It's, we, had it, we, we used to live on Edgewood, and in our backyard, right against our um, master bedroom window, was this gigantic fig tree. Like, it was huge. It was one of the biggest fig trees I've ever seen. It had a huge, wide canopy, and it was a prolific little sucker. Here's what you need to know about me. I hate figs. Don't like them. Don't understand them. Don't understand why people like them. You people who eat fig newtons, what's wrong with you? Those are for babies, right? And then you move on to adult foods. And, and so you have, and I just, it, you, do you know who does like figs? Blackbirds. Lots of them. And so during, like, when those figs would come out, those birds would come and go, ah! You know, right at our window, and I'm like, ah, I hate this tree. But Granny loved figs. And every now and then, she would send Arts over to get some figs. Or every now and then, I would get some figs and take them to Granny. And so while I wanted to kill the fig tree, I couldn't because I would disappoint Granny. But then I was down at Corpus Christi. We, we do an annual Methodist uh, conference down there, a, a meeting down there, and and a storm came through. It blew through San Antonio. It even blew through. Uh, it was a huge storm that came through Texas. And, and Jenna calls me. She's like, the fig tree fell over. And I was like, what are you talking about? She's like, it's on the fence. It fell over. You know, and like, what do I do? And I'm like, praise Jesus, right? <laughs> yes, prayer does work. Um, you know, I, like, I, and I was like, no, don't worry about it. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with it when I get home. And so I started Googling. I was like, what do you do with a fallen fig tree? Um, and you, you, you know what you can do with a fallen fig tree? Put it back up. Yeah, pretty much. You, it said just prop it back up. Get a big, t like, and I, so I got two by fours, and I started inching. I had to cut some off because it was so heavy. And I started getting it up, and, you know, Corbin was no help. Um, he, he was three, but still. And so I'm propping it up, and then I get this stake, and I put a big stake in the ground right on the other side, and I'm rope tying it off and doing all these things, and, and I'm trying to save this stupid fig tree that I don't like. And what I noticed, though, because I'm like, this must have been, like, how come, like, that's a huge win that must have come through. But as I, as I was looking at the root structure of the fig tree, there were no deep roots. It was all just like laterals. It was all stuff going out. I mean... It, was, it made perfect sense that the fig tree was knocked over so easily because there was nothing that was anchoring it down. And so for me, I was like, oh, this is why these trees are horrible. They don't think ahead. They don't prepare. They don't get stronger. They're just shallow. See, this is what Paul's doing here. He, he's talking about this fact that, hey, there's going to be strong winds that are going to blow across your life, and if you don't have those deep roots, you're going to blow over. You're going to succumb to the ways of the world or to what, whatever's going to happen. Like, you need to get those roots planted deep in the foundation of it all, which is God's love. And when you have those roots deep into God's love, man, it doesn't matter what wind comes your way, you're going to stand strong. See, what we need to do is, and what he was trying to do is he's like, I need, to, I need you to cultivate. Now you know Jesus. That's great. You know God as Father. Yes, that is awesome. But you got to get those roots deep. So how do you do it? He started by saying, I'm praying that the, the glorious one with, with unlimited resources builds strength in your inner being. An inner being, it, I did, my translation doesn't say that, but many will say inner being. And, and what he's talking about, because remember, he's talking to a Greek audience, right? So he's talking to mainly Greek thinkers, and Greek thinkers were all about the inner being. It was, it's philosophy comes from there, and so there was great discussion in all of this conversation around your inner being, what that looked like and what it was, and and Paul's like, you need to focus on these things. And I think there's three things that, that a Greek would say your inner being consists of. The first one, and what Paul wanted you to, to get strong, was reason. Like, we, we need to let God, strength, through the power of the Spirit, Paul says, strengthen our reason. And reason would be, you know, right, wrong. 
It's this understanding that there are certain things that are just right and there are certain things that are just wrong. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity alludes to this. He doesn't allude to it. He speaks of it. And he says, he's like, you know, every one of us has this innate understanding that some things are right and some things are wrong. And Paul is trying to say, hey, you need to let the Spirit grow that understanding in you. Give, give you the wisdom you need to, dis, to, to know right and wrong. To, to have the wisdom to go through life in, in a way that is more pure and safe than the ways of the world. We need to, we need to grow our reason. The second way a, a Greek would see it is conscience. Because you can know right and wrong, but, it, but if you can't discern it, if you, if you walk into a situation and you just don't capture what's going on in the moment, then you're going to be lost. Conscience, you know, it's, it's that word that some of, us, some of us have a lot of it, some of you have none of it, right? But it's that thing that if we, if we ignore, it becomes dull. If we just kind of, and it seems to me in the, in the world today that conscience has kind of just left the table because we don't want to offend someone or, or because we're going to get yelled at or attacked. And so it's like it, there's, there's so many particular individual truths that exist supposedly today that conscience becomes a very confusing thing. But what Paul is saying is, hey, I want the spirit to sharpen that muscle in you, to grow your conscience so that you are able to discern what is right and what is wrong. Yes, we have an innate ability to discern what is right and what is wrong, but we also have the words that God gave us to help us to discern those things. But Paul is saying, hey, we've got to grow reason. We've got to grow discernment. And then he said the third part of the inner being for a Greek would be the will. The will. Because if you know what right and wrong are, and you're able to discern when a situation's right or a situation is wrong, but you do nothing about it, what's the point? It's, it's that will, it's that determined effort to make a step, to take the action. That's the thing that, that he's like, you got to focus on that, on that will, on that strength. Because look, listen church, we are the body who is supposed to go into the world. Right? The, the command of Jesus, the commission of Jesus wasn't to just come in and sit on Sunday morning and just sit here and wait for people to show up. He said, no, go into the world, to all nations, teaching people about me, showing them who I am and how much I love them. To go, if if we don't strengthen our will and our determination to carry out the commission of God, then we lose. Because we're not doing our job and we're not bringing anyone else into the family. We may know Jesus ourselves, but it's not ours to hold. We gotta let it go so that others may know him too. Paul is telling us, man, you gotta grow in these things. Allow the spirit to move in such a way that, that, that your reason, that your conscience, that, that your, your, your will grows, that you, you sharpen these things, your inner being strengthened by the Spirit. He goes, and then when you, when you turn into these things, man, Jesus is going to make, make a home in you. And the word he uses there is a Greek word, katakin. And, and it's, it's the word that they use for permanent home. Right? It's, it, it ain't an Airbnb. It's, it's something that you homestead. You know? I, like this is, I, I want... Jesus is going to live in here, and he ain't never going to be evicted. So I want, I want you to do that, because when you do that, all these things start sharpening, and, and the, Jesus is there. That's when those, deep start get, those, those roots start getting deep. That's when you start feeling God's presence and, and moving into who he's called you to be. And it's going to get to the rest of his prayer that we'll talk about in the next couple of weeks. But how do you do that? Right? I mean, some of you may be going, hey, man, Pastor Michael, I'm in. I want to... I want to grow my inner being. How do I grow my inner being? This, this week, I got uh, the opportunity to speak at Curios, uh, which is, uh, they do this at, at Alma Heights, and it's a lunch deal where they bring in high school students in the visitor's locker room, and they have uh, a speaker from somewhere in the community come and speak and do, you know, give their testimony or devotional or whatever, and, um, and I had the opportunity to do it on, on Wednesday. Um, I, I say it like I wanted to. I'll be honest, I did not want to do this. I've, been, I've done it many times in, over the years, and they asked me, and I kept putting it off. I was like, I don't want to, it's, it's a three-hour commitment now. So, okay, so they, it's a long time, and I'm an important person. A lot of stuff going on in my life, um, and I was just like, ah. And I don't like high school kids that much. Um, mine, I love mine. It's yours, I don't. 
And, and so, I, and, and I'm going, and so I went in there, and I just, like, I, I was bitter about it, and 21 days of prayer, I kind of, God knocked me off, knocked me around a little bit, and he softened my heart and gave me some fire and some spirit to go in there. So I, I went in there, and, and, and I go in, and I asked the question that, that Jesus asks of the disciples, and, and then directly to Peter. He, he first says, who do people say that I am? What's word on the street? What's word on the street about who I am? And and they start throwing out some things that they've heard from other people about who he is. And then he looks at Peter and goes, but who do you say I am? Right? And that's a question that every single one of us is going to have to answer. That's a question that all of us are presented with. Whether you want to agree with that or not, you're being asked that question. Who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you're Messiah, the Son of God. You remember what Jesus says? He goes, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Because this wasn't revealed to you by man, but by our Father in heaven. Like, it was this huge moment for Peter. Can you imagine? Let's, I mean, we talk about it, and I, I'm sure that Peter turned around to the other disciples and went, boom. Nailed that one, suckas, right? You know, that's why I'm the best. But let's look at Peter after that. He made some mistakes. He did some stupid things. He said stuff he should he even denied knowing Jesus. Three times. Oh, you're one of those guys with Jesus. Jesus, I don't know who that is. Wait, I thought you said he was the Messiah. The Son of God. But then if you read the rest of Peter's story as recorded in the book of Acts, you see him stepping into his place as a leader and going into areas that no one else will go and bringing people who are outside in. He was doing what the rabbi had asked him to do. He wasn't quite ready to do it on day one when he first had that realization because what he does is he sticks with Jesus. He doesn't leave his side and he sees more and he hears more and he begins to build. He begins to let the spirit sharpen his inner being. So I called up some of the kids. There's two lunch, two lunches and I picked on two basketball players, um, each one of them. And, and one is on the freshman team, one's on the JV team. And and I had them come up, and I did the same thing with them, and I was like, hey, okay, so you're, you're, and most of the kids who come to, a lot of them are involved in some sort of sport or another, I said, okay, you're a basketball player. Yes. Great. Are you good at basketball? And one of them said yes. The other one said, well, I was like, well, good luck going on, man. You benched today. Um, and like, you guys say, yes, I am. Hey, what, you, do you just show up to games? He's like, no, we have practices. Okay, so what do they do? Do you get, a, you get something about the, and they talk about this practice sheet that they get every day. And it says the list of the things that they're going to work on for that day. Great. That is awesome. Man, that is so good. Do you spend other time outside of practice working on your game? Both of them are like, yeah, totally. Yeah, I got, you know, I got it. One of them, I know, he's like, oh, I shoot baskets at home, do all this stuff. I'm always out on the court doing all this. Man, that's great. That's so good. That's so good. Hey, um, are you in geometry? Yeah. Oh, good, good. How much time do you spend on geometry a week? Uh... Well, I was just in class. Huh, okay. How much time do you spend on basketball a week? And one of them goes, 30 hours? Huh. Which one are you better at? Basketball. Yeah. Because you're spending time in it. You're spending time in it. Look, God wants, to, God wants to make you the best basketball player ever. God wants to make you the best disciple ever. He wants to change your inner being and strengthen it, his, your reason, your conscience, your will. But you gotta spend time with him, right? Do what Peter did. Peter hung out with Jesus, and he learned from him. How many of you today, you, you've come into worship, but how many of you, are, like tomorrow, like, well, I, I did my Jesus today. Tomorrow's a new day. No, 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 no. It's every day. Like if we, we're all going to be asked the question, who do you say I am? And if you say, Jesus, you're the Messiah, the Son of God. Yes, that's the first step. But Paul and I want you to take it next steps. Go deeper. Go deeper. Because, because Jesus has more for you. He has this thing he calls the fullness of life. When you start operating in his presence and in his ways and using the gifts that he's given you to serve him and bring others into the kingdom, man, you find, you find fullness of life that you never experienced before. You get those deep roots because a big wind is going to blow your way. The winds of the world aren't going to stop. The ways of the world aren't going to quit. But the kingdom of God isn't going to fail. The kingdom of God isn't going to lose. 
because we have disciples who have a firm foundation, the rock upon which we stand, digging deep roots into the love of God. And when we do that, the church cannot be conquered. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and praise you so much for your son, Jesus. For the life that he lived, for the death that he gave for us, that he conquered death so that we might have life. I pray, Father, if there's anyone in this room who doesn't know you today, that today would be the day. Today would be the day that I say yes to you. They would turn from the ways of the world, turn from the ways of themselves, and, and say, yes, God, I'm tired of doing it my own way. Jesus, I give my life to you. Come and make residence in me permanent home. Help me, grow me into who you've longed for me to be. And God, those of us who've known Jesus for a long time, let us go deeper. Let us establish those deep roots so that no matter what wind comes our way, we stand strong. We do not topple, but we proclaim. God, we thank you. We praise you for all the ways that you move. All of this we pray in Jesus' name.